Welcome to beautiful downtown Burlington, and we're at Phoenix Books for a really special event tonight. We're going to be talking about building a sustainable future, and we have two authors here tonight. We have two books here tonight. One book is called Rebuilding the Food Shed by Philip Ackerman, either Least or Leist. He says that you can pronounce it either way, <laughs> which I thought was very nice of him. Uh, shows uh, uh, shows uh, a flexibility that probably um, probably is a good quality to have for a farmer, I would think. Um, I, Philip uh, has spent some time farming in the Italian Alps, which sounds amazingly great, uh, and also has been farming in Vermont for about 16 years, I think he said. Uh, he's a professor also at Greenmount College, and so we're, we're really happy to have uh, Philip here for that. The first author tonight is Elizabeth Courtney, and her book is called Greeny Vermont. And Elizabeth has spent a lot of her time in Vermont uh, working within government and without government on issues around sustainable development and, and development in general. So I know she has a lot that she's going to offer us tonight, a lot of ideas, a lot of discussion ideas, and uh, we're really looking forward to hearing what she has to say. So not too much uh, further. We're going to have Elizabeth come up and start to talk. Thank you so much. When I get together with folks to talk about the book. Invariably, people say, well, where did the book come from? What, what prompted you to write a book like this? And uh, I tell folks that over my 45 years in Vermont, can you all hear me? Do you want to move closer? I, ha I, have, a, I have a very soft voice. Uh, and I'll try to project. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, this book, uh, Greening Vermont, is about the environmental movement, the modern environmental movement, if you will, um, for the last 50 years. So, it starts in um, the late 50s, early 60s, uh, and takes us right through to today, 20 or last October. Uh, and uh, what I wanted to do as I was leaving my organization, I'm what I call graduated from the work world as opposed to retired. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was about to graduate and uh, I thought, gee, this is the opportunity. My last year at Vermont Natural Resources Council, I'm going to put together this book. And um, a friend and neighbor and board member, uh, Eric Zensi, uh, who is an author, uh, joined me in, in the writing. Um, one of uh, Eric's books is, is uh, right here on the, on the table, The Other Road to Serfdom, which he published while we were writing Greening Vermont. So, you can imagine what a prolific guy he is, um, and a very, very interesting um, writer who uh, focuses on um, ecological economics. So the book is in six chapters, uh, a decade per chapter, and um, starting with uh, the 1960s and the arrival of the interstate highway which uh, we all know we can thank Dwight David Eisenhower for because when he was uh, in Europe uh, during the war, he became very impressed with uh, the Audubon and wanted the United States to have Audubons um, all, over the, all over the country. What would it have looked like if he had fallen in love with the train system? <laughs> we would have a totally different country than we have now in terms of growth patterns. Um, I was uh, on a radio show this morning, WGDR, um, from Goddard College, and someone called up and, and uh, she grew up in, uh, in Great Britain, and she said, well, why couldn't Vermont and the United States in general have 
done what Europe did and, and clustered development, essentially, in villages and towns and cities. And in fact, the early settlers did do that. They, they did um, uh, cluster themselves, uh, usually on rivers, because the rivers were the transportation corridors uh, and sources of power, hydro power. So we started that way. Uh, but with the, uh, the automobile and uh, uh, Eisenhower's vision for um, y how to use that automobile, we grew away from, from the compact village settlement surrounded by open countryside, which is a quote um, from uh, a 1968 planning study that um, that Governor Hoff uh, um, created. So we had a vision from uh, the 1960s of uh, a goal to keep Vermont, to keep Vermont's settlement pattern of compact village settlement surrounded by open countryside. And all through the, the years, the decades of um, growth management in Vermont, those words have been echoed in every uh, legal document, every law, every regulation, uh, which is, I think, probably unique uh, to the country. Um, not that we have done that in every situation, and um, certainly there is a lot of development that <clears throat> that sort of um, goes under the radar because it's uh, too small to um, uh, be under the jurisdiction of Act 250, for instance. And um, probably 40 percent of the development in the state of Vermont doesn't go through Act 250 review. Uh, so, and, and towns vary in their ability or interest in uh, using that framework to, um, to guide growth and development. But we were ahead of the curve with Act 250, um, but I, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Uh, chapter 1 is about the highway comes to Vermont and, and the change that that creates. Uh, it's as if um, the uh, Information, it's like the information highway coming to, to us in the 21st century. This was the automobile highway bringing all of New England um, into uh, the state. There was a big um, land grab. Um, farmers were selling the farm to developers. Developers were um, not uh, going through any kind of review process. And um, Governor Dean Davis uh, famously stopped uh, a very large development at Stratton uh, that was being undertaken by an um, international, international paper company. And the owner, John Hinman, was on vacation in Quebec. And the governor calls him and says, John, you have to stop stop that development in Stratton. You're proposing 3,000 dwelling units up on the mountain, and there are only 300 people who live in the town to begin with. What are you, crazy? So John Hinman stopped and said, I'll stop until you have a review process for me to go through. So the governor um, tapped Art Gibb uh, to have a commission that would go all through the state and hear from Vermonters what they wanted to do about managing growth. Um, the 10 criteria of Act 250 were essentially created by the Gibb Commission and given to the legislature to uh, implement. It was a swift and wise piece of legislation that went through the same time the nation was uh, uh, passing Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act. Uh, and um, the creating the EPA. Uh, and this 
uh, happened under Republican president. Anybody know who the president was? Nixon. And uh, a Republican governor, um, Dean Davis. Uh, unlike what is happening right now, but we'll, we'll get to that. So we, so we go through um, several decades of um, implementing good planning uh, and uh, implementing uh, Act 250, good regulation, um, even though what was th two, three years after Act 250 was passed, um, its capability and development plan or the planning component of the Act was zipped out because uh, folks thought that this looked too much like statewide zoning. And indeed, we can take a lesson from that. There was a lot of top-down um, uh, authority here, and Vermonters wanted it to be bottom-up. Uh, so a patchwork of local plans that constituted um, a, a statewide plan would have been a better idea than some planners working in Montpelier to create it. Um, and I th think we've learned our lesson. Um, so I'll, I just want to briefly um, run you through the 12, um, uh, not the 12, the, the six chapters. Uh, <laughs> last time I looked. Um, <laughs> So uh, chapter number one starts with uh, a handful of gentlemen from, uh, from Woodstock who uh, essentially kept the uh, conservation movement, as it was known, not the environmental movement, going by buying up pieces of property to protect them from people. And uh, so the origins of the movement started with a handful of uh, activists. Um, I'm blanking on their names. Joseph Battelle uh, actually was from Middlebury. He bought Camel's Hump and gave it to the state of Vermont. He said, I could have bought a French Impressionist painting and hung it in my dining room, <laughs> but then nobody <laughs> would, have, would have seen it. Um, so it was that, that kind of thinking. And over the 50 years, we have taken, we've come from that few doing um, personal actions to many hands uh, working um, in uh, energy committees across the state, um, uh, farming uh, 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 enterprises, uh, and who are moving uh, the issue along, uh, along um, rather than waiting for somebody else to do it. But we'll, we'll get, get to that in a minute. Um, along the way, um, each chapter has a subtitle that is um, the theme of the, of the decade uh, that, the, that the chapter is about. So chapter one is, um, is called conservation. Chapter two is regulation. That's when we implemented Act 250. Uh, and once you have regulation, you have litigation. And so the next decade is all about the litigation that ensued after Act 250 was created. Um, and one of the stories we tell is of um, the Pyramid Mall, which was the first proposal for Taft Corners. Um, and interestingly, it was defeated by uh, VNRC's um, general counsel, who was Darby Bradley. And I don't know if you know that name, but he uh, led the um, Vermont Land Trust for 23 years. Um, he's stepping down this year, too. Um, so the uh, a and one of the things that we learned about litigation is that the victories are temporary and only the defeats are permanent. Big problem with litigation. You can fight and fight and fight, 
which VNRC did in uh, St. Albans. We fought a Walmart in St. Albans for 17 years and then lost. So that Walmart is going to happen in a farm field two miles north of town. Okay, so we tools in the toolbox. Conservation, regulation, litigation, regulation, litigation, um, and then um, a chapter on uh, what's the Asian? Um, polarization. You know, you fight long enough and you, you get, um, you, you start developing factions. So this was the 1990s and it was a very contentious time. You'll have to read the book. Um, <laughs> um, and there's a lot that's not in the book and we can talk about that privately. Um, so then the 2000s arrived, the 21st century. And we are so polarized that we say, holy smokes, what have we done? We've, we're, we're fighting, we're polarized, uh, something else needs to happen here. We need a different tool in the toolbox uh, that will allow us to get beyond this head bashing. And um, that was, anybody want to venture a guess as to what that might be? If you want to not be polarized and not be fighting, you sit down and you collaborate. So collaboration is the subtitle of the, of the 2000s. And um, the Housing and Conservation Board is a shining example of, of putting odd bedfellows together to collaborate. Um, uh, VEIC, the Vermont uh, Energy Investment Corporation, um, does a, a, a lot of collaborating with um, across interests, um, the uh, and and various organizations are, are mentioned. And again, you'll just have to read the book. Um, and uh, now we're in the decade of the 2010s. We're in the teens of the 21st century, and the theme or the subtitle for that chapter is localization. And round about the 2000s, uh, not only were we realizing that we needed to collaborate, but we realized that we had another problem. You know, we had gone through the last half of the 20th century focused on growth management. That was the problem. And um, we still have that problem. We're still, you know, getting people coming to Vermont and um, development pressures that need to be guided in a smart way. But on top of that is the layer of um, concern about climate change, um, about uh, mitigating it, about um, abating it and um, about suffering through the consequences of what's in the pipeline right now. So, um, and another problem that we have is the relative inaction of uh, our Congress um, and the relative um, lack of boldness of, uh, of, of our Vermont legislature. And um, quite frankly, Vermonters said to themselves, I'm not waiting for our elected officials to make it right. We're just going to make it right. And so this chapter um, of the 2010s, the decade that we're in, is different from the other chapters because we're in it. And um, we tell uh, several stories of uh, people on the ground um, working to keep wildlife habitat connected across the whole eastern um, United States, northeastern United States, um, 
there are over 100 energy committees in towns across the state working to uh, weatherize homes uh, and um, change light bulbs and plan for um, uh, plan for a new energy future um, and and others other activities that are on the ground um, GPI and uh, and a second wave of interest in growing in in agriculture and um, Phil's book uh, and um, greening Vermont are an interesting pair to look at together because uh, there's a lot of overlap and I don't know who had the brilliance to bring the two of us together tonight to talk to you um, but it's um, it's it's great my interest uh, <laughs> I have to tell you, I'm probably way over 15 minutes, but when I went to the printer to pick up the book, I was really excited to see it and to hold it and to smell it. And, and um, the uh, printer gave me my first copy. And I, I, didn't f I didn't feel the way I thought I was going to feel when I held it in, in my hands. And, um, I mean, it was beautiful and uh, it, it was fine, but there was something in, inert about it. It wasn't, you know, a living thing. It wasn't changing. It wasn't, you know, I wasn't, a, I, I, this wasn't a copy that I would write in the margins in, even though my kids told me, go ahead, write in the margins. <laughs> um, but what I realized was that um, I want to know what's next. And so what I'm um, uh, all about doing with the book now is uh, introducing it to students, to the next generation, um, who will write the next chapters, you know, and um, tell us what's the Asian that comes after localization, for instance. And, um, give that book a continued life. So I hope you enjoy it. And if you uh, are driven to write the next chapter, send me a draft. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, it really is a, a pleasure to be able to follow Elizabeth, because I think so much of what she's done here um, well, first of all, in her career has really left a legacy that has really laid the groundwork for what needs to be done next. And, and, and maybe that next Asian is the dynamization. And uh, I, I don't know if that's it or not, but um, it, it's coming. And I really have the joy of being able to work with <coughs> students of all ages, but a lot of younger students um, at Green Mountain College. And I, I really see it coming. And it's, you know, it's great to be here just in terms of celebrating sustainability and what that's all about. And, the good news we got at the college this week was that we um, were the only college or university in the country to get a number one, a, a perfect rating for sustainability in the Princeton Review of Colleges and Universities across the country. So, um, so that's really, and it's because we're in Vermont, and you know, there's so much that's happening here, and there's so much that that we're learning as we try these processes and we make headway, and sometimes it feels like two steps back and a step forward, but. You know, as I've been uh, traveling around quite a bit and talking to groups around the country, it's um, really fascinating because Vermont is absolutely seen as a model, you know, for the practices in um, which we really try to look at this managed development and also with food systems, and I think that's obvious. So um, I'd like to share a little bit this evening with you from um, some of the, the maps from the book, some of the ideas, and just give you a little bit of a sense of you know, how this all ties together and also ties together uh, with what Elizabeth was talking about. Because transportation and just what we've been able to do in terms of moving people, moving goods across the country back and forth, that, that really tells quite a bit of the story here. So I'd like to, um, to share a little bit in that regard. And um, so as we, I was talking with the folks at Chelsea Green and the Post Carbon Institute about this book. They said we'd um, you know, like you to consider writing this book on local foods. And I said, I'm not sure if I'm comfortable just with local foods. I, I'm interested in talking about local food systems. 
Um, but what we've done really, really well in Vermont is we have built out this notion of local foods. And we've done a particularly good job in building these um, small diversified farms and helping to really um, build the, the farm to consumer concept. And uh, we've done an amazing job. And now the, um, it's gotten more complex, so this carrot suddenly looks a little more like this. And um, things get more interesting, and we start realizing that we've got a system that we've got to deal with, and it's not quite as easy a task as we thought. And frankly, we're never going to be done, but we can do better. And that really is the message here. <clears throat> and so what I'd, I'd like to do quickly is um, show four maps. And I'll show them to you twice so you can get a little bit of a sense here. Because I, I think as Elizabeth did in her book, I've also tried to do in mine, you've got to know where you came from in order to figure out where you're headed and how you got here. And that's really one of the most interesting things for me is, you know, how did we get here? And in fact, we got here in some ways by default, by accepting the status quo, or simply by you know, really acting as consumers and not citizens when we think about our food systems. So what I'd like to do is share four maps with you. And the, um, they're 50-year increments. And what they're based on is the county-level data is the easiest way to read the trends in the United States, um, is looking at what's happening in terms of um, counties. So uh, what these figures are showing, when you see the green and it's greater than 50%, that means that the economic activity in a given county it was based on agricultural activity. So more than 50% and then less, and then um, you can see the, the gradients there. So I'll, I'll show this to you over the past 200 years and watch what happens as we move across the country. So that's 1850, that's 1900, that's 1950, and that's 2000. And so it's worth looking at again, I think. So you start to see what happens. It, it makes a certain amount of sense, you know, here as we're starting to move westward. It's really interesting to look at New England and what happens there. And you can see 1900 again, 1950, and 2000. And so really, you know, a good portion of what we've been doing is, is really um, it just giving up our food systems in many parts of the country um, and handing those over, if you will. So it's a really fascinating story as you start to look at it. And um, this is where I'd, I'd like to take you. And this is not how it happened. This is not the example. But this is one lens of looking at actually you know, how we got to where we are. So it, it was sort of a really neat coincidence as I was getting toward the end of the book, the research and the writing. Um, I, I just you know, I got more and more fascinated with maps because they start to give you the national perspective. And to understand local, you've got to understand national. And obviously, you need to understand international and regional as well. But I just um, I stumbled upon this map. I'm just curious, has anyone seen it before? Yeah, I'd, I'd never seen it. Um, and I've been teaching agriculture and various things for more than two decades. Um, so just stumbled upon it on the in, in the internet. And um, so this is from 1922. It's a map that was sent out by the Armour Meatpacking Company. It was sent out to public schools and libraries, in some cases post offices, all across the country. And it's a fascinating map. You can look at it online and you can read the text. And if you get home tonight, I'd really encourage you to do that. And I, I think it's um, oldmaps.com, I think. You can also see the flip side, which is almost more interesting. And I'll share a little bit of that with you. But what Armour and company were doing here was they were proposing that we start to um, create a food system that was nationalized and specialized. And when you read this text down here um, about New England, basically, I mean, he, he says, literally, that New England is really geared for industry and should not be um, a place where we really practice very much agriculture. And the idea for the eastern seaboard, according to Armour, was to concentrate as much as possible there in the Midwest, in the Chicago in particular, and really utilize that area in which to feed the rest of the country. And so obviously the westward expansion was continuing and intensifying. So the, the first goal was to feed the urban areas that were on the eastern seaboard. But as the expansion moved forward and there, was a, there were more demographics here, the agriculture started to build out more on the west coast, then it also made sense to ship food there, but not only ship it there, but also to bring it back to other parts of the country um, as it was shipped. So it was a, a really interesting idea. And on one hand, you have to admire you know, some of what the thinking was here. Um, you, know, you could make the argument that this um, really is, is food security in certain ways. Obviously, it undermines the food security that we think about at this point in time. Um, <clears throat> and this is what it looked like. This is, um, so you've probably seen photos like this, the Chicago stockyards. This is the armor plant back here. The last vestige of the armor meatpacking company right now is Dial Soap, and simply because soap is a byproduct of the slaughter industry. Um, and so that's the one thing that's left. 
And um, Armour was a brilliant person, and I wish I had time to go in the story, but you can read the book um, and, and learn more about him. P.D. Armour, who started this, was a really pretty incredible person. But the notion was that uh, Armour was going to be the bridge between the consumer and the, uh, the farmer and the consumer. That was the whole idea. And it wasn't just Armour that was doing this, obviously, but trying to build in some efficiencies and trying to build in the scale, really trying to standardize things. And um, the standardization was a really important piece of this. This is a postcard from Chicago from the 1920s. So if you went to Chicago in the 1920s, chances were reasonable that you might end up at the Armour meatpacking plant in order to actually see what was happening. And the reason for that was that this, who invented the assembly line? Yeah, that's what I thought too. But it was P.D. Armour. And he'd actually been in Porkopolis, that is Cincinnati, He'd started watching how they were breaking down the carcasses of the hogs as they were doing it. He was seeing certain efficiencies, but they weren't all put together. The pieces of the puzzle weren't all there. So he decided that he could actually create a factory in which um, you know, these hogs first were placed on this wheel, and then they ran on a bar that went all the way at a slight incline all the way through the factory. So in essence, it was a disassembly line, but he created this assembly line approach so that the carcasses would be broken down as efficiently as possible. And obviously, to do the scale at which he wanted to do this, um, that was really important. So um, you know, it, it's not the um, most pleasing <laughs> postcard necessarily, um, but it does give you some sense of the country's fascination, really, of how we were structuring our food system. And so, you know, to take it one step further, you know, on one hand, we were eliminating the rail system by the way of Eisenhower. Um, but at, for a while, in the early 1900s, refrigeration was really important just by rail. And so the first box car that you see here, the refrigerated car, was actually ice and sawdust with evaporative cooling. So as long as it was moving in the right, <coughs> and, and it was open, the air was flowing over the ice, they were able to keep it reasonably cool on the inside. And then we hit the era of uh, mechanized refrigeration, and suddenly things became much, much more efficient. Obviously, if you stop for very long in this kind of a situation, the spoilage is going to be more and more of an issue. So um, mechanical refrigeration was really important uh, for the next steps. And it was so important that actually Armour, um, the company, started building their own um, mechanized refrigerated, um, I'm, I'm saying that not quite the right way, but um, mechanical refrigerated um, rail cars. So they were moving things across the country um, like this. And I, if I remember correctly, I think it was 1947, late 1940s, when the first refrigerated um, transfer trucks were actually um, created at that point, and obviously the same time that we were building out the highways. So you start to see um, how we were doing this in some ways, what we started to think about. And what happened here was a really important piece. And that is that all of a sudden, when you've got, and there have always been middle people who've been involved in agriculture and food systems. That's just always been a given. But it really heightened it to the point that now we're in the situation where farmers, on average, are getting about 16 cents on the dollar that's expended for food. The rest of it is going in the um, processing, storage, marketing, um, distribution arena. So, um, you know, that's really part of what we're having to push against. And in many ways, this localized um, food system that we're trying to to recreate here, it, a lot of it is trying to get that fair, um, fairer price for the farmer. So, uh, you know, we come to this notion of a food shed, and um, that may not be a perfect food shed. Um, so I, I give you what might be a, a better food shed. So maybe you want to think about this as a food shed. And um, in essence, I think what I'm really trying to propose in this book, and it's the not all a novel idea on my part, but it really is that we use the notion of a food shed as new democracy. Because I think if there's one inalienable right that we have, it's that right to healthy food. That's first and foremost. And if we can start to think about the food system in which, uh, food systems really, in which we inhabit, then suddenly, you know, I think we can start thinking about them more democratically. I'm not arguing for a democratic food system, because frankly, I don't think it's going to happen. But I'm arguing for a much more democratic food system, one in which we participate not just as consumers, but also as citizens. Um, I, I think it's been well-intentioned, but we've also, um, we, we, we've really thought about our food systems in very individualistic ways. It's the individual consumer who's making the purchase, the vote with your fork. And frankly, if we keep doing this vote your, with your fork thing, we're not going to get very far. 
because we're a minority. It doesn't matter if you argue for sustainable agriculture, organic agriculture, local agriculture. You're less than 5% of the population in terms of what you're actually, you know, really vying for. So it's important that it be a political process as much as it is a, um, a consumer activity. So I really, um, I, I like thinking of the food shed as new democracy. And just to give you a quick history, the notion of a food shed actually came about in 1929. There was a guy, Walter Hedden, um, who was the head of the Port Authority in New York City. And they were thinking about watersheds. He was thinking about protecting the New York City watershed, as were other folks at the time. And um, he actually started thinking about a food shed and how could New York City protect its food supply and really be thinking about it. So he was thinking about these economic ebbs and flows. So it was a term he put forward. Uh, people didn't grab onto it too much. It um, was revivified in 1991. A scholar named Arthur Goetz um, pulled it back out. Jack Kloppenberg and some others in the late 90s actually kind of spun it out further that they were saying that the food shed is actually this place in which we inhabit, in which, you know, and, and we're trying to figure out where our food can come from, how we can localize it. So it's some topography, some infrastructure, some agricultural production capacity, thinking about it like that. Um, I think we need to, uh, those are all good definitions and they make sense, but I also, um, I, I'd, I'd like to think about it a little bit differently because inevitably you get to the situation where those, those boundaries are porous and they, they're always going to be a little bit artificial as we're trying to figure it out. So for me, a food shed really is the periphery of our influence. How far can we exert uh, this positive influence in order to affect positive change? So how can we actually do that? And obviously we do it part as consumers and part as citizens. And if we can think about a food shed as that, as the exerting this positive influence, we can kind of figure out how far out we can go. I mean, we're frustrated with the national system. And it's not to say give up. You can't give up on that. But at the same time, we know these arenas within which we work, live, um, and, and the places we really cherish. And I think that's an important piece for us. So um, Vermont is a national leader, there's no question. Um, and the Vermont food system diagram that uh, has been <coughs> just come out, I mean, we've, we've known what this looks like, but this is one of the new iterations from 2011. And um, one of the things I'm most proud about is we talk about the Vermont food system, and we, we're thinking of Vermont as a food shed of sorts, is the fact that we go full circle in Vermont when we talk about it. And so we're talking about this as a soil to soil plan. Um, so we're really trying to make sure that we hold on to that fertility, hold on to the resources within which this whole thing begins and not let go of that. And um, so, you know, I think it's a really amazing thing that Vermont has this farm to plate strategic plan that's come out. Uh, it's a 10 year plan. I think we're in year two right now. Um, you know, people have come together, tried to figure out what the common goals should be, how we actually build this thing out. Because Vermont, as you may have seen, um, in recent numbers and figures, we're the highest in the country by far in terms of per capita consumption of local foods, that is, foods from within our state. We're at about 5%. The numbers are hard to run. Um, you know, and that's, that's phenomenal because you know, nobody else is even getting up to the 2% the margin. So we're doing a great job. There was just a meeting a couple of weeks ago at the Vermont NOFA conference, and there must have been 60 or more of us in the room where we were trying to figure out how do we get to that next 10% by 2020. And there were some really smart people in that room. And there was a lot of head scratching. And we didn't come out with any concrete ideas. We've gotten the low-hanging fruit. So the question is, really, how do we actually move this thing forward? How do we build it out? How do we localize in a really meaningful way? And those, those are the head scratchers. But also, um, I think we need to be proud of what we've got, but not sit on our laurels. Because as you saw, I mean, we've, we've essentially spent about three generations picking apart the food system or just letting it fall apart in many ways um, or at least become more broken in some of our eyes. And so it's going to take, I mean, we're, we're talking about work of a generation to put it back together. And then it's the work of the generations after that to really remain vigilant and keep pushing this thing forward. So that, that's really the task here and it ties right, of, right into the, um, the natural environment and the natural environment and the social environment are wedded together absolutely because agriculture is ultimately that. You know, it really is the manipulation of these landscapes in order to create, um, you know, hopefully uh, sustainable food systems. So I think I'll, um, I'll stop there. I'll leave you with a photo of my favorite cow, Stacy, at home. And um, she can smile at you here. So, uh, yeah. So, great. Yeah, so I think we're just going to 
trade back and forth. And yeah, and yeah. I'm supposed That's to a, talk yeah. into you. <laughs> yeah, we might, we might even have a. <laughs> Mr. Terry. <laughs> <laughs> sure. That's uh, I, I, have, um, I have a response to your how, how are we going to get to the 10 percent. We have to work on making fossil fuel um, reflect its true costs. And this means a carbon tax um, or something like it. And it means that not only do Vermonters have to do that, but all our neighbors have to do it. All the country has to do it. All the world has to do it. Um, and there are countries that have uh, implemented carbon taxes, like Australia. And you know, I have to wonder why Australia but you, uh, I'm sure, are aware that uh, they have suffered mightily um, over the past five years with drought and fire. And um, that's a motivator. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, should we go for questions? Yeah. Is it? Or comments. Great. So, boy. See if I can if I can distill that one a little bit, and um, distillation is a good thing for Vermont local as well. Um, so essentially, the the question here, as I think I caught it, is how do we actually build this system out so that it's easier to get things from the farmer to the consumer, um, and to do that in effective ways so that the consumer understands what he or she has in front of them, and also hopefully, I think one of the questions is how do we make it affordable. Um, price points that are appropriate for the farmer, but also are affordable for as many Vermonters as are pos as is possible. Is that a reasonable summary? Is yeah, it? I don't think you need to go to the Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh -huh. yeah. Well, I I think you know part of the the question that we really face that that I think is fascinating now is is how do we scale it up, and how do we do that and still maintain a sense of community identity for the farmers also. Um, you know, just to try to do it by ec within ecological constraints that make sense. You get it to the point where the farmers are still able to have this, you know, viable price points, but also make sure that it's affordable. And um, one of the things that we've done really well in Vermont with small diversified agriculture, I think, is that we've been able to um, actually get this thing so that it works for the farmer. That 16 cents on the dollar, we've been able to expand that a long, long ways. We've also made local value added. You know, so it also commands a higher price point, um, which is, is good for the farmers. But then we're also up against the quandary of if we don't have a scale that's sufficient to actually feed more of our community, then we're also, you know, we're faced with another quandary. And we don't. You know, it, when you look around, I mean, dairy we can do, apples we can do, beef we can do, swine, you know, we, we can do, but it's, uh, it's not being done at the scale, you know, probably that is really going to be able to, to feed us at this point. Yeah, poultry. Yeah, mm -hmm. and poultry is brutal. You know, I mean, I think poultry is one of the things we really have to figure out. Um, and when you do poultry, you know, you're usually reliant on grain. Uh, there's some folks like Carl Hammer with Vermont Compost Company who's figured out ways not to have to be as reliant on it. Um, just talking to my students in class this afternoon, we were talking about ducks and geese. You know, why are they not more of the system? Because they don't need the kind of grain that, you know, that um, the rest of the poultry does. So are we willing to change our habits and have duck eggs? Are we willing to actually really utilize the, this grassy, moist landscape? Mm -hmm. So I, I think there are a lot of opportunities for building out, but the price point piece is something where we've all really got to give, and we've got to accept that the mid-scale is gone in Vermont in many mm -hmm. ways, in many sectors. Mm -hmm. and, um, and how do we get that back? careful what you wish for sometimes in terms of large scale. I mean, having grown up in North Carolina, I, you know, I'm not asking for what I left. <laughs> so it's, it's tough. Right. Uh, I, I would just add to that, um, remember, necessity is the mother of invention. And we need to make it necessary uh, in many, many ways. Um, financial, uh, the, the economics of uh, a feeding from a local food shed has to work. It has to work for everybody. And uh, in order for that to happen, this is, this is where government comes in. Uh, the government, the, the reason we all have a hard time avoiding um, high fructose corn syrup 
is because the United States government has subsidized the corn industry since uh, the 1800s, probably, or at least the early 1900s. Um, so we have to shift that subsidy um, and start thinking uh, in terms of uh, a, n a new energy future, and that includes the, the food, the food shed as well. I'm yeah. I'm surprised that no one has developed in Vermont a better processing. I mean, processing, as I know, one of the biggest problems when you talk about any of the animals you're talking about. And and I'm surprised no one has come forward with, you know, a good plan for that. That, I, I'm sure this isn't the only one in the state, but there's a food hub in the Mad River Valley that is um, enabling uh, the local farmers to keep food that they don't sell at the market and, and sell it over the course of, of the winter. That's an infrastructure piece that is critical to a year-round uh, income for farmers. And um, yeah, from, from blueberries to um, swine. Yeah, not. There are people out there yeah. who know how to process it. Right. Have yeah. Willingly we, offer them some we lost that infrastructure about 100 years ago. It started deteriorating. Yeah. And um, we have to rebuild it. There, there's a pretty interesting story, too, with the, the whole food hub nation. Uh, uh, food hub. <laughs> food hubs at the national level because it, it really is sort of the hot topic. So where can you actually start to aggregate, you know, these products you know, and then process the products, sometimes do collective distribution or marketing. Um, so a food hub, you, you sort of create your own recipe for what you want the food hub to be. And, you know, the, the Mad River Valley is one example. And then certainly in Hardwick also here at the Intervale um, Food Hub, they're, they're really neat projects. And, and it's also beginning to happen more and more with the um, slaughterhouses as well, you know, here in the state. And so I think we're beginning to realize that. But part of what happened um, just a couple of years ago, the reason we have this statewide plan is because a lot of us were setting up these regional organizations around the state and we were starting to propose some things that were going to be bricks and mortar processing facilities. And the, um, the Vermont philanthropists essentially threw up their hands at one point and they said, stop, we're not going to fund anything else until you all coordinate at the state level. And that's actually an interesting lesson, I think, for localization because localization does need to happen at the community level, but you also really have to coordinate that so that it's sensible because if we create these little fiefdoms all over the state and we start bumping into each other and then we have an overcapacity in processing, we really haven't done ourselves any good either because it's such a brutal competitive environment. You know, the margins are so narrow in terms of the processing. Um, so it's, it's a real challenge. Um, but Vermont is up for doing it, and it's being coordinated at the state level now. The Agency of Agriculture is probably the most progressive agency yeah. in the country yeah. in terms of being willing to help move this along. And the legislature has helped fund the, um, the whole process. So we're incredibly lucky. I mean, just you know, being in the Carolinas recently, Arizona, there's just not the support at the state level. You know, you're bumping up against the state every time you try and do something. UVM is a land grant, you know, one of the most progressive in the country as well. So we're, we're incredibly fortunate. I, I hear uh, coordination being the, the, t the subtitle of the next chapter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, good point. Yeah, yeah. and I think you know, one, of, one of the other pieces is all of this, who, who ultimately owns it? That's the hardest question as we're doing this and we're trying to build it out collectively, collaboratively. That, that's a hard question because sometimes the nonprofits are the Kickstarters to get it going. Sometimes it's a farmer cooperative. Sometimes it's a consumer-farmer relationship. Sometimes it's just an enterprise. And, um, and that, that's one of the hardest things, I think. And that, that's going to test our ability really to make this thing resilient and, endura and, and durable. So. You, you have question, um, looking to kind of the next phase of this process, what do you see the role of technology? Is that, is that something that has done more harm 
Farm Food is that a, a venue for more innovation to sort of expand what Vermont is naturally capable of? I mean, we're not going to grow oranges here naturally, but is that something you're looking towards, or is that something that you're arguing against? Yeah. Um, what is the role for of technology uh, as we look into the future? And I'm assuming you mean tech technology is in, in the broad sense from communication technology, which helps us to be better coordinated if we use it right. Um, but uh, technology in terms of um, what is the technology that goes into creating a food hub, for instance? Is that what you what you mean? You could answer that however you like. <laughs> <laughs> well, but Phil yeah. will answer that however he likes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's a great question. I, 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 I think it's what we decide we want technology to do, where we want it to take us. You know, that that's ultimately a lot of it. I mean, there's no question that um, you know when you look at what's happening in terms of just you know, on the, the smartphones and the apps that are coming up, and some of them are springing up, and they're regional food organizations that are listing CSAs and farmers markets and where you can get local produce here, there, when you can get it. I mean, some of that stuff is, is really cool, um, and there are other things that are, are going to come down the pike as well. Um, but at the same time, you know, my, my, my worry in some ways is the technology also presents the potential to divorce us from the landscapes in which we live. And, and, you know, I find myself in that same boat. I'm doing so much on the computer, so much on the smartphone. And, you know, when I'm out on my farm, you know, I, I need to just be paying attention to what's going on out there, you know, every day, every minute. And you, you it starts to put up a wall in some ways. I mean, that, that kind of communications technology, while it can also help. Um, but then, you know, we're figuring out a lot of things with them. Um, Flash freezing technologies, I think, are really interesting. They're energy intensive, so how can we actually get those things to minimize? Just the basic technology, season extension in the last decade, the high tunnels you see on the farms now, you didn't see many of those out there a decade ago, and, and they're really taking us into a new production landscape. Mm -hmm. they, there's embedded energy in those things, um, but they also, it, it might be worth it. Depends on how you run the numbers. So it's a really great question. And, yeah. Unanswerable. <laughs> yeah, my uncle just told me that um, we still have our family's peach orchard in North Carolina, and he was um, he's been looking at China, and they have more peach production in China under season extension under these plastic high tunnels than in the states of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia combined. Wow. So is that a good thing? I don't know. It can mean you spray less in some cases. You know, you get a, a more complete harvest, but there's there's a lot invested in that old thing too. Yeah, it, uh, it's it's like any p piece of machinery. It, it depends on who's driving it, and and what the what what the thought process is. And I think in terms of um, education, um, we need to be. Uh, helping our next generations uh, be critical thinkers. Um, so uh, I, I think on the way up, I heard uh, about a um, new way of looking at education that turns it on its head um, in that the homework is done at, in school and the listening to lectures is done at home on a video. There's technology, you know, that is necessary in order to do that flip. And maybe the flip is, is a good thing, maybe it isn't, I, I don't know. But assuming that it is um, helping the students to learn faster, better, um, you couldn't do it without technology. Um, what, one last question. I think. I just wanted to make a quick comment about technology. And I'm up in Franklin County, and there's a couple of towns that do a kind of farmer's market online where everybody, different producers have different things, and people decide what they want and put their orders in. And then weekly, everything is at a couple of local central places. You go pick up your order. But it involves many different farmers producing this or that. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a way to coordinate. They don't have to go 
be in town on Saturday afternoon, they can stay at their farm mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. keep an eye on things. So that's really yeah. nice. Yeah, that, that coordination is going to be more and more important. Uh, coordinating transportation um, in a rural state like Vermont, it's, it's hard to satisfy all of our transportation needs um, with public, edu uh, public transit because um, it means getting rural. But um, if we're coordinating through technology, um, you can pull up a screen and see, oh, Mary is, wants, to, wants to go to Burlington today. Um, we should, you know, share a ride. Is that it? Awesome. Thanks. Great. Thank you Good. all. Thanks for coming out.